Hey everybody, Tim Albrecht here, and welcome to this week's episode of the YFP Podcast, where we strive to inspire and encourage you on your path towards achieving financial freedom. Now, aside from being pharmacists with a passion for personal finance, there's something else that you and I have in common, and that's that we have to file our taxes each year. Now, I know what you might be thinking, Tim, it's only January and the tax filing deadline is still a few months away, 95 days to be exact in case you're counting. Do I need to start thinking about taxes right now? I get it. But the truth is that now is an important time to shift gears and start thinking about the strategies that you can use to optimize your tax situation. And that's why I'm excited to welcome back onto the show, YFP Director of Tax, Sean Richards, to talk through getting ready for tax season. We discuss on this episode the difference between tax planning and tax preparation and how effective tax planning can prevent costly mistakes. To learn more about the services offered by YFP Tax, you can visit yfptax.com. Now, whether you're looking for help with your individual taxes, business taxes, or both, YFP's comprehensive tax planning combines traditional filing with our proactive year-round planning process. All right, let's jump into my interview with YFP Director of Tax, Sean Richards. Sean, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here before we get into tax season while I actually still have a chance to get on the pod and talk to you. Absolutely. Catch me in a couple of weeks and I'm probably going to ignore all of your calls and everything. So get me while you have me. Tis the season. Uh, indeed, we had you on episode 283 not too long ago. We talked about how to optimize your tax situation as a pharmacy professional. We'll link to that in the show notes for folks that want to go back to that. But as you mentioned, he, here we are in the midst of tax season, this episode going live right around the middle of January. And Sean, this is about the time where we start to see those tax forms coming in the mail. I don't I don't know if folks maybe are, are like me where I start to pile those up on my desk, maybe for clutter, clutter, clutter or the, the fire or whatever. <laughs> clutter the countertop a little bit. It's that visual reminder that we're going to be filing our taxes. And one of the things we're going to talk about here today, not not only what are some things that folks can do to hopefully have a smooth tax filing season, but also how can we be strategizing and planning hopefully year round and not necessarily just house on fire when we go to file our taxes each April. So yep. we're going to talk in really a few different parts. Number one, what are some of the ways that that folks can prevent some of the costly mistakes during filing a season? What are some of those common mistakes that you see? We'll then talk about some of the differences between tax preparation and tax planning. And then we'll talk about some of the changes uh, that folks need to be aware of for both this tax filing season, some of those coming from the Inflation Reduction Act, and then also some of the things that folks can be looking out for into the future. So I'm ready if you're ready. Should we do this? I'm always ready. Like I said, this is the most ready I'll be for a while. So here we go. So let, let's jump into some of the costly mistakes that folks may find themselves making during the filing season. Obviously, we want to avoid this if we can. You recently wrote a blog post on this topic. We'll link to that in the show notes. But give us some of the examples as you've been talking with many pharmacists that are interacting with YFP Tax, many pharmacy clients. What are some of these examples of mistakes that are being made that if we had some more proactive planning, perhaps we could have prevented? Yeah. And thanks for bringing up that blog post because that really gets into the nature of how a lot of these kind of arise and, and can be prevented. So the, the idea, not to you know give everything away about that, but the idea of the whole thing is really just sort of being able to go back in time if you could, right? And in, in a lot of circumstances in life, it would be nice to be able to get a redo and be able to go back and kind of you know get a, get a mulligan, if you will. <laughs> but with uh, a lot of things in life, you can't do that. And taxes are one of those mm -hmm. things. So I would say, you know, the biggest examples where I see pharmacists or anybody really making mistakes when it comes to taxes is not planning ahead and kind of looking back and saying, oh boy, I wish I had done that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that time that you had a great year and you, you made a ton of money and, you know, maybe you even had a side gig going and you had so much cash that you didn't know what to do with it. But then you come to the end of the year and you didn't have that cash anymore when your actual tax bill comes due. Yeah. So, oh, I wish I could have, you know, put some of that money aside, done a projection, see what I'm going to owe at the end of the year, maybe make estimated tax payments if you apply for something like that or, you know, something like, hey, 
real estate's hot right now. You bought up a place, you fixed it up, you finally sold it, you hit that peak before interest rates went up, and and now you're sitting there going, oh my goodness, I have to pay taxes on all those capital gains. You know, what are some things you could have done to maybe be, make different improvements to the house or, or take advantage of those improvements against your basis when you're calculating the taxes or hey, maybe I could have um, invested in some solar property or something, mm -hmm. take advantage of some of those credits that we'll talk about with the Inflation Reduction Act. So things of that nature. Uh, a big one with pharmacists is loan forgiveness, right? PSLF. So you know, if you're, if you're looking at this and you're saying you're, you did your taxes and you're, you're going to apply for forgiveness in the future and say, oh, maybe I could have you know, filed separate from my spouse last year or if I had done this a little bit differently, then maybe I could have had some more of my loans forgiven. So it tends to always be, and I'm not going to say always, but it, there tends to be a common recurring theme of if I had just planned ahead and I could go back in time and change these things, you know, maybe that problem wouldn't be there. But, you know, actually, now that I think about it, I had a personal situation. I, I like to bring this one up because it's near and dear to me. And if, uh, if I can ever prevent folks from having the same thing, I know early in my career, I was lucky enough to have RSUs given or granted mm -hmm. to me. And uh, I was a you know young budding accountant and went to do my taxes and paid the capital gains and said, okay, that's fine. I understand. I cashed them in. I, I have my capital gains. And it wasn't until I was looking at it in, uh, a little bit down the line and talking to some of my colleagues that I realized I didn't actually account for that properly. I had already paid taxes on some of that. And then I went and basically double counted mm -hmm. and paid again. Mm -hmm. So RSUs are one of those things. I know a lot of pharmacists get them. They get excited about them. And if you don't really pay attention, you don't talk to somebody who knows you know, what they're doing with these things, you can end up double paying and the IRS certainly won't reach out and let you know that you did that. You'll have to find that out on your own. So, Yeah. And Sean, to that point, we've worked with a lot of the pharmaceutical industry fellowship programs. And as a result, have a handful of, of those that are in pharmaceutical industry as clients, whether it's on the planning side or on the tax side. So this is something that we see come up a lot about trying to understand what are RSUs and what are some of those tax implications and you know, certainly student loans, you mentioned PSLF strategy. It's a big one in our yep. community, R real estate. You know, we've got a whole separate podcast dedicated to that topic. So of course that, that can be something that's top of mind. And then the first one you mentioned is something, Sean, I know I'm seeing and hearing more and more of, we featured many pharmacists on the show that are beginning to monetize their clinical expertise in a variety of different ways, whether that's a business, whether that's a side hustle or perhaps a side hustle that turns into a business. And as you mentioned, you know, often there's that new income that's coming in. And by the time we get around to filing, we're maybe putting that income back into use in the business or other expenses that come up. And then there's that surprise tax bill. So yes, we're, we're doing good. We're growing the business. We're achieving that goal of monetizing whatever we've been working on. But are we proactively planning for obviously the tax bill that's going to be due and, and how can we plan for that throughout the year? So yep. great examples. I know that will touch many people that are listening. So the next question then is, wh what is the antidote to these mistakes? And you mentioned a couple of times you were sharing that, you know, really that more proactive tax planning, not just necessarily looking at that point of filing where we're looking backwards, but really thinking strategically throughout the year can help us not only prevent these mistakes, but also optimize our overall tax strategy. So define for us the difference of tax planning versus tax preparation and why it's so important that we understand how these two are so different. Sure. So tax preparation is the traditional, what you think of with taxes. It's, hey, you go to your account at the end of the year, you hand them a big box of receipts and say, here's all the stuff, all the things that you were just talking about, you get in the mail, you put a little pile on the table, you bring it to your account and say, these are what I have. This is what I did last year. You know, get my taxes done for me. Mm -hmm. And that also is the traditional area where people kind of are fearful about taxes or have, you know, that, that stress like, oh my goodness, am I going to owe something? Or even, you know, getting a big refund is, it can be a good thing. But at the same time, you just gave the government an interest free loan for however long, right? I mean, getting a big refund, there's probably a pretty good chance you could have done something better with that cash. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's typically the, the surprise or the, idea I was talking about like, oh goodness, I wish I had done that in the middle of the year in July, something like that. That's tax preparation. And it's not inherently a bad thing. It needs to get done. Again, it's what most people are familiar with, whether it's going to a, an accountant or going on to TurboTax yourself and getting it mm -hmm. done. But that also, again, is where a lot of these stresses tend to come from. On the flip side of that is this idea of tax planning. So that is not just thinking about taxes at the end of the 
year, but making sure that you're keeping them top of mind throughout the course of the year and you're synergizing your tax strategy with your overall financial strategy. And one thing I want to be clear about is I don't want people sitting there all day long thinking about taxes because, I mean, maybe I want to do that, but a lot of people don't. And that's not what we're getting at with tax planning. It's mm -hmm. not where you're sitting there all day long and, you know, how how is this going to impact my taxes? It's just making sure that when you're making decisions that it's not something that you're thinking about in April or, you know, next filing season, but it's something that is in your mind. So, mm -hmm. hey, I'm thinking about buying a property at the end of the year. You know, what will those implications be from a tax standpoint? Or yeah. I've been working this side gig, you know, should I be putting cash aside and, and, and trying to plan ahead and everything? So one analogy, if you've ever heard me on the pod, I think I talked about this before, or if you've ever talked to me in person, you're probably sick of hearing this one, but I often compare it to, you know, tax preparation at the end of the year is like a film editor versus tax planning is like mm -hmm. a film director who can kind of mm -hmm. change things throughout the course of the year. A new analogy I'll kind of introduce this time around, I'm really into cooking. So what I've found it to be is tax planning is sort of like reading the recipe, prepping your ingredients, getting everything kind of ready to go. Like you watch these tasty videos, they all have everything measured out and they're just mm -hmm. pouring it in at the time and it's all kind of ready versus you know, tax preparation is the last step of getting everything plated and putting it all together. Would you want to do all that piece without having done any of the prep work to begin with? You know, Are you going to try to throw everything together when you haven't even cut the potatoes or anything yet? No. I mean, ideally, if you're preparing a meal, you want to also plan, cut the things, read the recipe, and just have a good idea throughout the course of the whole thing. So that'll be my, uh, my new analogy going forward until... Um, maybe until I get sick of cooking and then I can come up with something else. I'm smiling because I can totally see you this past weekend cooking and thinking, oh, I've got a, I've got another analogy for how I'm going to explain tax planning versus tax preparation. So exactly. I was probably panicking and realized I didn't cut something ahead of time that I needed to put in and was saying, oh my goodness, if I had just done that ahead of time and made the connection there, most likely is what happened. Yeah. And I think you've given some really good examples, you know, Sean, I was thinking about this this morning, e even when I was working you know, a W-2 job, pretty simple tax return, pre-kids, there still was this kind of underlying feeling of like, am I really optimizing everything? What, what I don't know, I don't know. Number one, you know, yeah, I could do the TurboTax, I could do the H&R Block, I could, you know, figure that out. But, you know, how is this really interfacing with the rest of the financial plan? And then obviously, over time, as things become more complicated, you know, more than one income, perhaps, or rental properties, or you know, children enter the equation, changes of income throughout the year, all these different scenarios where there's some real time adjustments that you want to make, as well as, you know, how can we look at all of these things across the plan to make sure we're optimizing this in the best way we can. And, you know, Sean, you know this because you're my phone a friend on the tax side, but probably once a week, once every other week, it's a, Hey, I've got this notice. I've got this question. What about this? You know, what, what's it looking as we're thinking about the estimated payment? you know, whether it's on the business income or question related to, to the real estate piece. So there's just so many things going on. And I, I feel like I have a high level understanding, but there's a whole nother layer of depth that obviously, you know, you and others with this expertise have and can really advise people to be thinking across the entirety of what's going on with the taxes and the financial plan, but also, you know, looking at how can we be more proactive uh, than just simply doing the filing each year. Yep, I agree. And the thing is, is that taxes often become a stressor for folks because they don't plan ahead. And that's the biggest mm -hmm. thing is that, you know, you go to your mailbox and you see a letter and it says the IRS on the top and you immediately get this fear in your head. And it's because you think, oh, what did I do wrong? Or what did I, what should I have done otherwise? Or yeah. something like that. I mean, it really just comes down to if you are thinking about these things proactively, if you have sort of that phone a friend that you can reach out to throughout the course of the year, you're not going to be worried when the time comes because you'll say, oh, I already talked to him about that. I already know what this is going to be. Yeah. Oh, this letter from the IRS is just the refund check that I'm expecting to come back from them. It's not mm -hmm. going to be that fear anymore. So let's shift gears and talk about some of the tax changes that individuals should be aware of. I think one of the main advantages in, in working with a professional is that you, know, you as the individual don't have to sift through all the changes that are happening and understand the implications to your own plan you know, you can get the cliff notes version of that or someone that's looking out for you and obviously has an understanding of your individual situation. So Sean, my understanding is there are some changes that folks should be aware of that impact mm -hmm. this filing season. And then there's also some other changes on the horizon that will impact things in the future. T tell us more. 
Yeah, I mean, at this stage of the game, I don't want to say it's too late. It's almost never too late to do really anything. But given that we're getting into January of 2023 now, you know, not a whole lot to talk about for 2022, but just a couple things to keep top of mind for folks, especially because it's questions that people may have mm-hmm. when they're talking to their accountant. Hey, this looks a little different than last year. So, so one big thing that will probably be glaring to a lot of folks is there was a $300 above the line, we call it credit for charitable deductions that has happened for the past couple of years. So that basically, even if you're not itemizing your deductions, if you've made charitable contributions, you were able to take $300 of that as a credit. That is sort of no more going forward. So in order to take those charitable contributions, you're going to have to itemize your deductions. Mm. So again, just want to point that one out because I know a lot of people, it's sort of, it was right there on the front of the, on the form. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people will probably think, Hey, what happened to that? But that also brings up a good point that, you know, you always want to, and another reason why working with the tax professional to stay on top of these things is really helpful because different states, different jurisdictions all have different rules when it comes to these things. I know I was just talking about charitable contributions, for example, and in the state of Arizona, that's actually something where you're able to make donations Mm -hmm. up until the filing date, sort of like you can traditionally with IRA accounts when you think of on the uh, federal side of things. So that's another reason why I say, even though it might seem like it's too late, you know, it's not always too late and really want to keep in mind that different states and different jurisdictions have different kind of rules with that. So, Which is why, Sean, you, you love the Ohio jurisdiction and the Rita, right? Isn't that your favorite? Yeah. Love <laughs> would be one word that I could use to describe it. I would definitely say that that's one of them. Um, it keeps <laughs> me on top of my game. I could say that too. I'm running out of nice things to say, but yep, sure. We'll go with that. <laughs> Sticking on the the subject of sort of top of mind, you know, 2022 things to keep in mind. One of them, and this is not so much of a, hey, it's something that you can still do now, just something that you're going to want to really be careful of, especially with your when you're talking to your accountant and, and you know, tr- probably trying to argue, hey, how come I'm not getting the credit for this or something? You alluded to the Inflation Reduction Act. So that mm-hmm. was the act that President Biden signed back in August. So a lot of changes to a lot of things, specifically energy credits, things of that nature. So good number of changes to keep an eye on there. A big one is the residential clean energy credit. So that is traditionally, and forgive me, I can't think of the old name. They keep changing the names of these things, but mm-hmm. keep in mind, you know, solar, geothermal, that type of thing, the really um, the renewable energy sources. Mm-hmm. So that was supposed to drop down to a 26% credit in 2022. That bump back up to 30% in 2022, and that's going to go all the way out through 2032. Mm. So that's a good one to keep in mind. Electric cars, that's another one very important. So as of the the date on this one is August 16th. So if you bought a car before August 16th of last year, electric car, sort of the old rules, I won't get into those. You're probably familiar with them. Mm -hmm. If you bought a car beginning August 16th and through the end of last year, an electric car, there's a final assembly requirement where your vehicle must have been assembled in North America. So those rules apply as of August 16th of last year. So Mm -hmm. something definitely to keep in mind there. And then going forward into 2023, if you purchase a car in this year going forward, there's not only final assembly rules, but there's mineral sourcing rules. There's sort of battery component rules. So a lot stricter requirements there. We can link to uh, the Department of Energy has a good list where you can kind of put in your VIN and and see if your vehicle qualifies and what it is. But mm-hmm. um, the long story short there is it, it's a $7,500 credit going forward. But again, you want to keep those dates in mind whenever you purchase the vehicle. So that's kind of one of those things to keep in mind. Now, that's a good segue into 2023. So again, closing the door in 2022, a lot of good things heading into 2023, specifically around those energy credits. We talked about new or electric vehicles, we talked about new electric vehicles, but starting this year might bring a lot of people into the uh, the used market here. So used electric vehicles, there'll be a new credit, 30% up to 4K of those. So that's um, something definitely to look forward to. Mm-hmm. Energy credits, again, not so much on the solar geothermal side, but more on the Hey, I got new doors, new windows, the typical sort of regular household improvements. Mm -hmm. You're probably familiar with those being a $500 lifetime credit. That starting this year going forward is actually going to be a $1,200 annual credit. So that is quite the jump there. Um, Definitely some new restrictions and everything to keep an eye on. You know, obviously want to talk to an accountant about all that kind of stuff, but that's a very big jump from $500 a lifetime to $1,200 a year. So definitely want to take advantage of that going forward. Is that one that, you know, if I 
invest, I don't know, $10,000 in new windows that you can disperse that credit over several years or is it within the year of purchase for 1200 right? Because a lot of those you know, examples you gave, windows, doors, roofs, et cetera, obviously going to be fairly significant expenses. Yeah, so it, it, you it's in the year that you actually dole out the cash that you get the credit back. Okay. So, and in a lot of cases these credits are non-refundable. So what that means is that if you at the end of the day don't owe anything or don't have any taxes to offset, oh, you don't yeah, yeah. get that credit back for yep. you. So, refundable credit basically means, hey, if I actually offset all of my taxes and still then get some, you'll actually get that back as a refund. A lot of these energy credits you just want to take a look at all of them. I won't get into the which of which of which, but some of those are non-refundable, meaning they'll offset your taxes that year, but not going forward. Which which is another great example of planning, of, right? Of, of planning, exactly. <laughs> exactly right. You you beat me to it where, you know, if you're making a big a capital yeah, purchase, you say, sure. all right, I'm putting in these new windows or I'm getting this solar, I'm finally getting it done. You want to make sure you have the taxes to offset. You That's know, maybe right. you sell some of those investments that you've had for a while, take on some of those capital gains, use the credits to offset it, or you know, that's where that tax planning definitely yeah. comes into play. Yep. Absolutely, You're taking my job, man. Sorry, it was a good. It was a good example. I was just thinking about all. All obviously, large percent of our community may may be doing home improvement projects, other things. This is a common one. I think will be coming up. Absolutely. Yep. But yeah, I mean, sticking to this year, I don't want to say it was a boring year. Every year from a tax standpoint, is exciting in my mind. But the biggest thing I would say outside of the energy stuff, the name of the game has been inflation. So obviously inflation is top of mind for a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of inflation related changes going into next year. And what does that mean? Mostly means limits are going up for a lot of things. So 401k mm -hmm. deferral limits, that was up $2,000. That'll be twenty two five this year. Catch up deposits also up a thousand, so that'll be seventy five hundred dollars this year. IRA contributions went up five hundred dollars, so that's sixty five hundred dollars this year. The catch up stayed the same on that, but similarly, inflation. So starting next year, twenty twenty four, that will be indexed to inflation. Mm -hmm. So that's another one there. Tax brackets. So all the tax brackets were bumped up a bit due to inflation, and I'm not going to get into the specifics of which one each of those. You know, each of the limits are there. The overall story is that you know you basically can make more money before you bump into that mm -hmm. next bracket. But the one thing I really want to hone in on there is a lot of people don't really, I don't want to say don't understand the concept of tax brackets, but a lot of people think, oh, you know, I don't want to make another thousand dollars because that's going to bump me into the next bracket, or mm -hmm. ooh, you know, how's that affect me? You know, is that going to put me in the next tax bracket, or how's that look with everything? I just want to make sure a lot of folks on here understand the idea of incremental dollars being taxed at that next bracket. So what does that mean? If you're right on the edge and you make an extra hundred dollars that bumps you into that next tax bracket, that hundred dollars will be at the new tax rate. The rest of your cash is all getting taxed at the rates that you were before. Mm -hmm. So I don't want anybody here who's got a, two job offers on the table and saying, I don't want to take this higher one because it's going to put me in the next tax bracket. That's not Bad how move. it works. Yep. It's only going to be a couple extra dollars. Uh, I know that's a, a big, scary one. So that's where you know you hear about effective rates yeah. and everything. There's uh, a lot, of, lot we can get into there, but I just uh, don't want to scare folks any more than they already are. Sean, it reminded me as you're talking. I'm sure many folks listening are familiar with the the Shit's Creek episode where D David is talking about you know the the tax the tax write offs and the things that he's buying because they're they're a tax write off, right? And this write off. It's like we yeah, yeah. we we need, we need an episode on on the incremental uh, approach. And I mean, you hear that all the time of like, oh, I don't want to go in the next tax bracket, or if I earn you know additional money, I'm going to go into that. And I think a lot of that may come from you know, the mis misunderstanding of how that works in terms of the incremental approach. Exactly. Right. You never want to turn down more cash. And I think we had talked about before, but even though it might not seem like the best thing, a bigger tax bill at the end of the day generally means that you actually did better mm -hmm. that year. So, yeah. Well, this is great stuff, Sean. And I want to transition. One of the things we're, we're really excited about as we head into this tax filing season is that for, for new clients of YFP tax, you know, we're really putting a stake in the ground that we're not doing filing only. And one of the reasons we, we got to that decision point was everything that we're talking about right here, which is that we really feel like tax when done well is really proactive, it's strategic, and we're thinking about this year round so that we can optimize that situation. And yes, filing is a part of that, of course, but we really need to be thinking, you know, more strategically. And so that's one of the reasons that we are really excited, Sean, to be introducing YFPs, what we're calling CTP, Comprehensive Tax Planning. Tell us more about 
what it is, you know, who is it for and potentially who is it not for as well? Yeah. So comprehensive tax planning is, it's a lot of what we had talked about before, right? So the idea of really synergizing your tax strategy with the rest of your financial strategy. So it's something where you're touching base with us throughout the course of the year. And it really depends on what your individual needs mm-hmm. are. It's not something where we're saying, hey, every Friday at five o'clock, we're all getting on the call. <laughs> it's the YFP tax happy hour. We're all going to talk about taxes and everything. That's not what this is all about. It's really for everybody to look at their own situation and say, hey, I- I'm looking for more guidance on my withholdings. Mm-hmm. You know, Maybe it's something where we're meeting a couple times a year to talk about hey, I have this new side job. I think I have to make estimated payments now. Can we talk about what that looks Mm -hmm. like? Or maybe it's something where, you know, I have a real estate property that I'm I'm thinking about purchasing at the end of the year, but I don't even want to begin to go down that path until I can talk about what what are the implications Mm -hmm. here? What if I rent it out a couple days a year? What if I rent it out 100 days a year? You know, how does that look? Can I live there? What are the tax implications? So it's really for folks who want to not, wait until the end of the year, like I said, and say, hey, here's my box of receipts. Mm -hmm. I'll see you next April, get my stuff done. And who really want to be able to sleep at night when it comes to taxes Mm -hmm. and don't want to open up their mailbox and say, oh no, it's the IRS. What could this possibly be? So Sean, if I'm interested in learning more about the comprehensive tax planning or perhaps even ready to get started, where's the best place that I should go? So the best place to go would be yfptax.com. So that's our new and improved website we launched recently. It has a lot of different resources on there. It has the blog that you mentioned before, a lot of videos that we posted throughout the course of the year with some of these updates and some of these new tax laws that we're talking about. And it really has a breakdown of all the different services that we have. So whether it's the comprehensive tax planning CTP that we're talking about here, or maybe it's, you know, you have a side gig and you're interested in doing some bookkeeping for that. You know, we do we offer bookkeeping services all the way from, hey, I just have a couple of contractors I need to do payroll for, all the way up through what we call our fractional CFO service, which is more of the, hey, let's sit down, let's talk strategy about my business, let's put some forecasts and budgeting together and everything. So that website will have a great starting point to get you started. But from there, you can get in touch with me. I'll answer any questions you have. We can get on the phone if you want to look at my face, we can get on a Zoom <laughs> call together, or I'm happy to you know, talk via email, answer any questions. So you can reach me personally at sean at yfptax.com. Again, you can also go to www.yfptax.com. You'll get links to me. You'll get links to all the things that we're talking about here. Uh, that's definitely the best place to start. And what I would say is definitely, if you're interested, don't wait. We're getting into tax season. I know that you know I- I'm biased to say that, but I think you're going to lose a lot of us in a couple of weeks. So might be not a bad time to hop on there and take a look. Don't wait indeed. This is really the, no, I'm not going to say quiet. You guys got a lot of stuff going on, but really the the lull before the storm that is the tax season. And then obviously some hibernation of rest and recovery thereafter. So make sure to head on over to yfptax.com. Lots more information there. As Sean mentioned, you can reach out to him directly to set up a call, get some more information. If you're ready to get going, you can also click out a complete a quick form. You can get started, but all the information is there on the website. Sean, thanks so much. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you after tax season. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely the calm before the storm. But like I said, it's sort of like if you uh, watch the weather channel before a hurricane, even though it's the calm, everybody's still prepping and getting ready and everything. And then once it's all said and done, yeah, it'll be it'll be nice to uh, touch base in, in May once everything's kind of a little bit calmer. Great stuff. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. As we conclude this week's podcast, an important reminder that the content on this show is provided to you for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide and should not be relied on for investment or any other advice. Information in the podcast and corresponding material should not be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any investment or related financial products. We urge listeners to consult with a financial advisor with respect to any investment. Furthermore, the information contained in our archived newsletters, blog posts, and podcasts is not updated and may not be accurate at the time you listen to it on the podcast. Opinions and analyses expressed herein are solely those of your financial pharmacist, unless otherwise noted, and constitute judgments as of the dates published. Such information may contain forward-looking statements, which are not intended to be guarantees of future events. Actual results could differ materially from those anticipated in the forward-looking statements. For more information, please visit yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash disclaimer. Thank you again for your support of the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast. Have a great rest of your week.